Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I will be your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from across Canada to learn about themselves, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we, we believe on this show, the best way to understand a community is to actually talk to the people who live there. Shocker. So that's why we are honored to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome Councillor Amy Cody of the town of Grand Falls, Windsor in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Amy, I want to start with the million dollar question that I started all my interviews with, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go way, way back. Um, I've been on council since 2009, actually, so I'm in my fourth term. Uh, but my love of politics and my interest in municipal council started when I was in high school working with the local radio station, VOCM. Um, my father worked there. He was an announcer for over 30 years. And I worked there uh, producing the AHL hockey games and doing summer relief as an announcer. So, of course, I would cover the news um, and always be in tune with the news. And, of course, growing up, because dad was involved in radio, the radio was always on in our house. Um, so, of course, without politics, there's not much news. So I've uh, just always been interested and, um, you know, just always wanted to get further involved. And as I got older um, and had children and just really started to feel attachment to my community, Grand Falls, Windsor, I uh, decided to throw my head in the ring. And I did that in a by-election um, and did not get elected in that by-election. There was one seat available, and I think there was like six or seven candidates. Um, and then not long after, like within a year, I think there was another by-election. Threw my head in the ring again for one seat. And again, like six or seven candidates. And again, it wasn't me. So um had two children at that time. Uh, so then between that second by-election and the general election, I had another child who was 11 months old when the general election came around so had a four-year-old uh, a two-year-old and a newborn pretty much um, and ran in the general election and was elected and have been elected three more times since then and serving proudly as a counselor in Grand Falls Windsor all that time and, and still love it and just as passionate as I was back then. So I want to go back to your high school years, because I was in high school when I got first introduced to politics. And for me, it was provincial politics. And then my passion for municipal politics grew later on in life. But what was the draw for you about being involved in learning about municipal politics at that young of age? Because not a lot of high school students would say, let's talk about municipal politics, <laughs> I can imagine, especially in Grand Falls, Windsor, or even out here in Calgary. Yeah, and I guess it wasn't really an interest in municipal politics. I guess I just start, thought I should start, you know, at the tier one, <laughs> um, you know, because it's always been the provincial and the uh, provincial and federal politics that are always in the news and that you hear the most about um, and wasn't ready to take a leap into provincial or federal. So I said, well, let's start at municipal didn't realize that municipal is where the real magic happens and where all the work is actually being done. <laughs> I know, right? Don't tell anybody. But uh, so, you know, started, figured I'd start here at municipal and then that's where I've been holding steady ever since. You, you talked about how your dad was in the radio and you got, you were volunteering for the radio station as well. But at the dinner table, was politics talked about or was it sports because you were doing your AHL <laughs> hockey uh, uh, tournament? So was politics discussed at the dinner table? Because what I liked in high school, I can tell you, there's not a lot of things I liked from what I was in high school to now. So for you, was politics discussed at the dinner table and did it foster that relationship of the desire to learn a little bit more? Um, it was. And I mean, you know, my father has always been associated with a particular party like that's been his favorite, you know, and he doesn't tend to stray. Except maybe a couple times when, you know, he had 
some real good friends who were probably going against his usual party um, and supported them. But, uh, you know, it, it, it came up from time to time. I won't say it was always the topic because it was probably just him and I who were interested. My mom and my two other sisters had zero interest in talking politics and dad always worked the early morning shift. So he was like early to bed and, you know, he was back home when we were gone off to school and stuff. So, um, you know, just again, just as I moved through my community and then as I was raising my children, seeing the different uh, recreational offerings that were available to them and uh, seeing different things where I thought maybe, you know, something could be done differently, or maybe this would be of interest to the certain group of people that I was, you know, has spending my time with new parents and um, working in uh, the IT sector at the time in sales and things like that, just seeing how different things could work in our community and just figured, you know, have got some ideas. Let's try this out. So. So what, what were those ideas? Because so you first were elected in 2009, but you run into by-elections. I'm assuming mm -hmm. they're close to that 2009 general election for municipalities. So I'm assuming probably 2008, 2007 era. So what yep. was happening at that time that Amy says to herself, you know what? Now is the time. If not now, when? If not now, what, what, whenever will I do it? So what was happening at that time in yourself, but also in your community that you said, now it's my time to have my voice heard? Yeah, well, we were right off the closure of our paper mill, which was, we were an industry town. I mean, we were a paper town for a hundred years and then our mill closed. And, you know, at that point, nobody really knew if our town would even survive at that point. So we knew that we needed to diversify our economy because, I mean, we had the paper mill and then we had, we still have our hospital. So two major employers in our community. Um, and when the paper mill shut down, it was like, okay, what are we going to do now? So, you know, just being, um, you know, in that time and wondering, is there even going to be a future for me here um, and my children? Um, so just like I said, in, in raising the children and doing different things with them um, and not seeing a whole lot of diversity around the council table. We had women on council before, but, it, you know, it was, it tended to be um, all men, uh, you know, retired men, um, you know, people who were in the, in the sector working, but had since retired. Um, so, you know, not really a whole lot of representation for me and, sure, and my family. But I want to pose this question to you because you're, you're a unique entity in the fact that you ran once, you lost, you ran twice, you lost, you ran a third time, and then you won. What did you learn about yourself and what did you learn about your community in those first two by-election losses? Because when you lose, you learn more about yourself than when you win. So for me, when I mm -hmm. lost, I learned that I can strive a little bit harder. I can do a little bit more. For you, what were those learning experiences like? Well, and it's funny that you say lost because when I talk about this, I always am really cautious about not saying I lost those elections because I gained so much in those elections. I didn't win that seat at that yeah. particular time or those particular two times. But after the first time, like I was so green going in, I had no idea. I knew I had to campaign. I knew I had to talk to people, but you know, and I knew what I, uh, I thought I knew what the issues were, but when you get out in the community, you hear so much different. So after the first time, you know, you, you pick up so much from, from the first instance. And then the second instance, it was even more. So I was getting better at it. I was learning more what questions to ask. I was digging a little bit deeper into what the issues were. I was being more vocal in my ideas and some of the thought processes, um, how I marketed myself, my flyer, how I positioned my signage, where I was more strategic and where I placed my signage. Um, so then again, and then by the general election, people were like, okay, she's really serious. Like she must really want this seat. She must really be dedicated to uh, gaining a seat on council. So, you know, they took a chance on me. But by the time the general election rolled around, you know, I was, 
I was very comfortable with how I spoke to people, what, you know, uh, really understanding what the issues were in the community, how to communicate my own ideas, and just really, uh, you know, dig in. And I think the community saw, again, my interest. I didn't just run in the by-election and then, you know, fade off into the sunset or whatever. Um, and, you know, once I, I did get elected in 2009, I've been doing the work ever since. And the people have been rewarding me since then because of the work that I'm doing. So I'm really happy and proud about that. I want to know from you, because after my first two uh, not wins, defeats in my case, um, I, I always have this moment in the back of my head says, do I really want to put myself through this again? Do I really want to put myself out there and then potentially come up a third time and potentially not win? So for you, when you decided that general election, you you had been active in your community, you had stayed active. Was it an easy choice? Was it an easy choice to say, you know what? Third time's the charm. I'm going to go out and do it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I knew I had a better chance in the general. I had a one in seven chance, whereas, I, you know, I, the other times were less likely. Um, so, but I, you know, had I not been successful in the general, I may have washed my hands of it all at that point and said, okay, they're just not interested, you know, and uh, probably would have. But I mean, in each um, re-election, uh, and after each term, making the decision to run again, there, I mean, it's always nervous because you don't run to lose. You run because you want to win. And then you're always thinking about, oh, my, I'll be so disappointed if I'm not elected and I'll be embarrassed if I'm not elected. And, you know, if I'm not elected, well, do they think I'm not good enough? Why wasn't I reelected? So it's always a bundle of nerves when you're moving into that. And then of course, with every different term, there's so many different people who are putting their name out there as well. So, you know, you're thinking, okay, are people going to want to take a chance on this person and, you know, say, all right, we'll try this one instead of voting for Amy again. So um, it's always scary, but, you know, it, you got to do the work regardless. And it is what it is at the end of the day. Democracy is democracy. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you a funny saying that a, a town manager, a retired town manager with the town of Grand Falls, Windsor used to say, and I just love it because it just rings true. He used to say, democracy sucks when you don't get your own way. <laughs> and I just, I love that saying because it's so true. Democracy is so important, <sighs> but you don't always win. <laughs> But it's it's something that we need. You, you talked earlier in the interview about the municipal politics being the front line of politics. You make the decisions. It affects the day to day people. But when I talk to municipal leaders from across Canada and they talk about what they hear during elections, it's not just municipal issues. It's provincial issues. It's federal issues. Mm -hmm. How do you and have you seen a change in apathy or engagement on municipal issues in your time as councillor from that first by-election to 2021 when you were last re-elected, where people are more willing to talk about municipal issues rather than federal issues or provincial issues or vice versa? Are people wanting to know more your stances on provincial or federal issues and not worry about the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality? I think they're more concerned about the municipalities now um, because municipalities have gotten so much better at communicating with the responsibilities that we have. Um, and I've learned so much in my role uh, as president with municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador in representing 274 of our municipalities across Newfoundland and Labrador that you know, we're responsible for 60% of the infrastructure that runs through our communities and our province. Um, and that's a huge responsibility. And we've gotten better at promoting that, talking about that information. We uh, work hand in hand now with the provincial government. Um, you know, we have a really good working relationship with the provincial government, regardless of the party, um, you know, through through the years. 
and having a seat at the table is what we always promote and it, you can't make decisions without having our input so we always stress the importance of having a seat at the table and they have been inviting us to the table and asking for our input we don't always get what we want you know some they'll listen to us um, and they'll invite us but sometimes you know they go ahead and make their own decisions and whatnot but we always hold them to account now as well so we've gotten better at at doing that and talking about the work that we do and the importance of the work that we do um, and as municipal councillors I mean, what we always talk about, if we walked away and the province was left with everything that we do as an added responsibility to the work that they also do, maintaining provincial roads and provincial infrastructure and just, you know, ma managing communities, then there's no way that that work could get done. Um, so we are a very important uh, piece of the pie. Do you feel and, heard? You know, Do you feel heard with the uh, provincial government from time to time? Like I can imagine. For the when most I... part. Okay. What yeah, about the federal the government? Part. Because I know uh, in your role as president of municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, you're also mm -hmm. sitting on the board of FCM. Um, while I don't want to ask about FCM because that's a different organization from yeah. you, but you sit on the board. Do, does, do municipalities in Newfoundland and Labrador feel heard by the federal government and the federal representations that you have with your MPs? Yeah, I, I definitely feel that we do. Um, again, you know, there's areas where you feel you're not um, and we aren't, but we're, again, we're doing much better at communicating. And I attended the FCM board meetings a few weeks ago up in Ajax, Ontario. Woo, my hometown. And I know. Yeah, and it was <laughs> awesome. And I did a presentation there from municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador on um, sustainable municipal infrastructure. And at the end of my presentation, it was just amazing to me how many people came up to me to say, you know, regardless of what province they were in, the size of their community, the population, the type of infrastructure that they had, they were experiencing the exact same problems. So it's you know it's right across the board it's across the province it's across the country and we all have the same message and we are being heard by the federal government and by our own individual provincial governments but again it's a work in progress but we're getting better at that communication and i think we're getting better at understanding that we can't do without the other um you know the the provincial government needs the federal government the municipal government needs the provincial government the federal government needs the municipal government like it you know it's a cycle Big circle. And we all have to work together yeah so we're, we're getting better at that so i want to turn back to yourself for one last question on this segment before we move into segment two and that is you have been elected in 2004 times uh mm -hmm. and you have had the honor to serve your community for four terms how much of a weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers to make sure the decisions you make are the right ones, but also help people out in the community? Because I can imagine mm -hmm. if the decisions you make impact someone, you're going to hear about it. You're not going to be able to go to the grocery store without being uh, told what mm -hmm. they what someone's thoughts are. So for you, What's that weight like? And do you still have the same weight from day one in 2009 when you were first elected to today as of recording this? Um, it's extremely important to me that when I walk into those council chambers or into the boardroom um, to make recommendations or to review policy or to decide, you know, what infrastructure is being replaced, how, you know, where are we putting our, our money in our budget? What are we doing? Um, that responsibility, it never lessens. Um, it, it, it tends to get greater because you get better at it. You get a better understanding of what you're doing, why you're doing. Um, all the decisions that we make aren't always right. Uh, we make them based on the best information um, and information changes. And sometimes you make a decision and then you get information after the fact and you think, oh, if we had known that prior to, 
maybe the decision would have been different. So you, you know, you, you make the best decisions with the information that you have at the time. If you have to make changes later, you make them later, but um, you also can't flip flop either. You can't be wishy washy. Like when you make a decision, if it's the best decision at the time and you, you know, you kind of have to follow through with that, um, you know, unless it's something that's going to cause harm or whatnot. Um, but, you know, it, you just really, as long as you're, you have a good staff, you're getting good information and you're talking about that, like you have to have communication amongst your council as well. It's no good to, you know, for your committee to make a recommendation and then, the rest of the counselors don't ask a question about it or don't say, you know, well, why did you come to that conclusion? Why is that your recommendation instead of this? You know, if things just fly through and they take your word for it, which is great, you want to have that level of trust, but you, there also has to be a level of understanding as well. So it's a huge weight when you go in to make those decisions. Um, Does it get easier? Does it get easier after so many years? Because like, there's a lot of people in BC, Ontario, Manitoba, who just got elected for their first term. There was a lot yeah. of turnover. Give some, give a silver lining to these people. Is there hope? It it gets easier because you learn what to ask for. You you know what you should have looked for before. So the next time that issue or decision comes around um you know what questions to ask so you're you get better you get to be a better investigator uh you know so you know what to ask for you know what you're looking for you know you understand you remember the problems that were encountered the last time you remember the successes um so it gets easier that way um and you do you you get better at your job um, if you, it, you know, if you're not getting better at your job and you just really don't care anymore, well, then I would suggest you step away and, and just watch from the outskirts again and give somebody else a chance. But, um, you know, I've, I've learned to uh, listen more and talk less, um, you know, when we're in that information gathering stage. And I've learned how to communicate better with residents as well when they ask the questions, well, why did you make that decision? Um, instead of saying, well, because that's what they told us was the best one. I can now say, well, because we, we asked these questions, we did this research, um, you know, we talked to the companies who are providing these materials to do this type of job. We spoke to, you know, experts in the recreation field. We worked with consultants, you know, where to look, you know, you know what, um, you also learn what your residents want to hear as well. So you get better at it. You just do. And the more you work at something, you you know, you should get better at it, regardless of what it is. Practice makes perfect, I guess. I want to turn to segment two. And now I was going to ask about the, the town of Grand Falls, Windsor, but I'm going to expand it a little bit here because I feel like you'd be up for the, the conversation here. And I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself and the president of municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador and myself. Um, I'm going to ask the president, uh, Cody, first question. <laughs> um, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing municipalities in Newfoundland and Labrador as of recording this? Uh, right now, I think it's the cost of infrastructure and our infrastructure needs in our communities. And I would say that that is also one of the biggest issues in the town of Grand Falls, Windsor as well. You stole my uh, second question. <laughs> sorry. I, like you said, I, I, you get better at this. You get to anticipate what the questions are going to be. But, um, but, you know, we're struggling. Like I said earlier, you know, we're responsible for 60% of the infrastructure in our communities. We've got hundreds of communities with less than a thousand people in those communities. You know, it's an aging demographic. Um, the, there's not a lot of businesses in these smaller rural communities. So the only opportunity you have for tax collection is property tax. Um, and that only goes so far. And, 
you know, this last year alone with the cost of inflation. I mean, one of our budget asks for the provincial government this year was a $6 million increase in municipal operating grants for municipalities because the 22 million that we have had um, since 2015, the inflationary, inflationary dollars today, 22 million costs us 28. And that's just to do the same level of work and this provide the same level of service that we're providing right now. So, you know, an additional $6 million just to keep doing what you're doing. I think that speaks volumes to the amount of work that councils do and the cost of doing that business. You, you represent, I want to make sure I get this right, 274 municipalities across Newfoundland and Labrador. Mm-hmm. Now, each one of them has their own unique issues that are going on with them. Now, you as the president of the Associ- the municipalities of Newfoundland and Labrador have to lobby mm-hmm. the provincial government to say we need more funding and then at the end of the day you have to then look after where the money goes how do you and how does the provincial government how do you work with the provincial government say okay this area needs more money because there's bigger infrastructure deficits here but over here they also need a little bit more but at Mm -hmm. the end of the day they're only giving you 22 million to give out to 274 municipalities, which I can imagine is a quite uh, a small sum when you look at it for larger urban centers compared to smaller rural areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the way the municipal operating grants work, that formula is derived by the provincial government. So it's based on population. And you think geography. it's fair? And I'm, I'm, I apologize to ask the political question here because it's a conversation yeah. that's happening out here in Alberta and Saskatchewan right now where they're, the smaller rural communities are feeling left out. It's as fair as it can be right now. Um, obviously, there's work that we can do. Um, I mean, you look at the current formula where it's based on population and geography, you know, um, with this increase, some communities have lessened, decreased their population. So if they're using the formula, we don't want communities to get less. You can't do more with less, right? They they have to at least maintain the level of funding that they were getting. So we know that there's going to have to be some work done there to make sure that they continue to get the funding that they're used to getting because they still have to maintain the services, whether they have 500 residents or 450 residents or 250 residents. They still need to turn on their taps to get drinking water. They still need to be able to flush their toilets. They still need to get their garbage collected. They still want to go to the playground, you know, with their grandkids or their children or whatever, whoever's in that community. Um, So again, it's a balancing act. So the provincial government distributes those funds, but we are in constant consultation and communication with our members as municipal councils through our spring symposium and our fall convention and our regional meetings and just our regular day-to-day business and advocacy work uh, to make sure that we are constantly on top of what their needs are, where they're struggling, um, you know, where they're where they're building, where they're finding strengths to make sure that we communicate that to provincial and federal government officials to make sure that, you know, there's no surprises ever. Now, I want you to take off your president hat and put on your councillor hat. And I want to talk about infrastructure in the town of Grand Falls, Windsor. Um, What are we talking about infrastructure? Are we talking about aging pipes, aging roads? What are we talking about the infrastructure deficit that you're currently facing in your community? Well, our community is growing. Um, You know, there's mining industry that's happening in our area, you know, healthcare, um, just all kinds of, uh, you know, all kinds of sectors that are happening here now where we're diversifying with the closure of the mill. So, um, you know, we and are you still feeling impacts from the closure of the mill from 2009? I think we'll always feel. Okay. There, there'll always be some impact. Um, I mean, as it stands right now, the mill doesn't even stand. On, it's been demolished. So there's not even any evidence of, you know, that, <laughs> that building structure being there anymore, except for the fence that's around their property and things like that. But, um, you know, there, 
there'll always be an impact from that because I mean, it's so much history for one thing, like the history of the mill and how the town was built and all the people who worked there. And, you know, the mill used to be a huge uh, contributor to the community, whether it was sponsoring sports teams or, uh, you know, offering a grant and loot to the community, all those kinds of things. So there'll always be, you know, I don't know, but always, but, you know, they'll, you'll uh, still be some impact um you know as we go along but so you know as we have people moving into our community you know you've got um smaller uh communities whose population is declining because they're moving into the larger centers um so they're looking for services so you know there's housing needs there's um you know we have pavement to maintain and as our town grows and our streets grow or we add streets to our inventory you know they need paving they need curb and gutter and sidewalks they need pipes under the ground um you know you need to maintain your green spaces in those areas for beautiful buying those parts of the community. Um, we just had to do major upgrades to our wastewater treatment facility. Our uh, drinking water facility is a regional facility that we share with five other communities here in Central. Um, so, you know, that needs to be constantly upgraded and, and kept to standards and the cost of chemicals for doing that and maintaining the drinking water to the level. So, and then your recreational offerings. I mean, people want new and different things in the the, the trends change. And so we have, you know, two stadiums, two ice surfaces that we maintain. We have several playgrounds, water parks, um, you know, YMCA, um, walking tracks and walking trails around the community that have to be maintained. So, uh, and then of course our own infrastructure, like our town hall, our recreation depot, our public works depot, all of our equipment, I mean, that all ages out needs to be maintained and purchased again and our light fleet. So, you know, it's, it's massive. The cost of fuel just skyrocketed and diesel this year, um, you know, and with that, the, the cost of fuel and, and chemicals are asphalt. I mean, normally the amount of asphalt that we try to do every year just to maintain, um, you know, that gets less and less every year unless you can find additional funds for that because the cost of asphalt has gone through the roof. So, so I'm going to ask the tough question then, because this is, I think a lot of people, a lot of municipalities, a lot of counselors like yourself are struggling right now because you cannot go to your residents and say, we need a 20% increase to finalize yeah. all these issues. You can barely go to your, uh, I know some municipalities are passing a 9% tax increase and I'm hearing up in arms about that, but you only have one tax base. It's the people and it's the businesses. How do you, how do municipalities survive like yours when you have such a growing population, but only a tax base to survive? And while the province is coming to you and saying, here's some money, like you said, that 22 million that you're looking for is actually 28 that you need for municipalities mm -hmm. to continue on. Is it tough to be a municipal councillor when it comes to budget time these year, these days? It's extremely tough. And a municipal operating grant, the seven largest communities in Newfoundland and Labrador, which Grand Falls Windsor is one, we don't get any of that funding. So that's for the smaller communities and the, you know, but the smaller communities are facing so, the same issues, right? So it's not like are. you and are, are not facing the same growing or degrowing community issues. It's just, you're not getting the funds that other communities might be. That's right. But we uh, and the reason for that with the municipal operating grants is because the larger communities have the larger business uh, tax base that they can draw on, um, you know, and, and people moving into their community and tend to be rising populations. So they say the provincial government says that we should be in a better position to get those. However, on the flip side of that, it costs us that much more to continue to do business. So, you know, it's kind of a catch 22, but um, I mean, it's a constant struggle. We're lucky uh, because we have, you know, a lot of the larger communities have engineering staff in place that can manage our projects, that can prepare the tender packages, that can, uh, uh, you know, work on your capital works projects, watch your budget and things like that. The smaller communities, I mean, they may only have a, a clerk who works half time um, who is doing all of that work. 
and you know the, and they have to go out and find consultants and engineering firms to be able to plan their projects for them so that's an additional cost burden on them to get that work done for them. i mean they may be doing a small paving project but because they have to go out and hire an engineering firm to do the planning for them to do the tender package and whatnot you know their costs are a lot higher than as well so you know you you really have to maintain a balance. You want to constantly be adding to, you know, maintain a, a quality life or enhance the quality of life of your residents. But you have to be able to think strategically about what's it going to cost and what is the additional benefit by, you know, if you're adding another walking trail, is that increasing the benefit to your residents when they already have walking trails, um, knowing that it's going to be an additional cost? And that the cost to maintain this new trail is going to have to somewhere come from somewhere, whether it's a business tax increase or, you know, a property tax increase. So it's all about balance and um, and you know, learning when to say no. We can't do that, really. Is right? it easy and to say no? Uh, it gets easier. <laughs> it gets easier. <laughs> Um, but it's still difficult. You know, you never want to say no. You want to, ha you want your town or your city, your community to be the best. You want your residents to have everything that they want. Um, but it's just not possible. So, you know, finding that balance um, and just being able to manage expectations and take care of what you already have as well. Um, you know, it's no good to add three or four different new walking trails or a recreation facility or whatever, when that's going to mean that the ones that you currently have in place are going to fall into disrepair. So I, I again, it's some, all about balance. I want to ask one last question before we turn to our last segment here, because I'm cautious of time. And it's a new question I've been asking a lot of counselors and mayors, and it's about apathy. Um, we are seeing a large apathetic voter turnout across this country when it comes to municipal politics, even engagement in municipal politics, whether it be boards, commissions, mm -hmm. or even just surveys that municipalities are doing. It's hard to get engagement. Are you, as councillor from Grand Falls, Windsor, seeing that issue in your community? And as president of municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, are you seeing apathy across the province when mm -hmm. it comes to engagement of municipal? Because people people are, are excited about provincial politics. They're excited about federal politics. But that municipal politics, the front line, it's cricket sometimes. Yeah, it is. And that is very difficult. And that's why we've been doing a better job of promoting ourselves and the work that we do and the value of being a municipal councillor. Um, M&L has done a Make Your Mark campaign the last couple of, of elections where we talk to municipal councillors, talk about the work that they do, what it's like to be a municipal councillor, what are the benefits of being a municipal councillor? Um, you know, and we need to do a better job of engaging um, uh, diverse individuals. Um, you know, we need to be more welcoming in our communities. We talked about code of conduct in our municipal um, councils now is a big thing. There's just been new code of conduct legislation passed. Social media is can be your best friend or your worst enemy, and you know you get the keyboard warriors. I mean, who do you get it at Newfoundland really and Labrador as well? Them. Oh, it's everywhere. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's you know people just get on the keyboard and they just type whatever they want, and it's like it didn't come out of their mouth. <laughs> they didn't say it because they only typed it. So you know they got a clear conscious type thing. But, uh, you know, it can be horrible and um, just misinformation. So you're always trying to stay ahead of it and or make corrections or provide the right information, getting the message out before, um, you know, people have a chance to kind of muddy it up or, or misinterpret what the, the actual plan or message is. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's a struggle, but you work through it. And for the most part, I mean, People are excellent um, and they're always, you know, they're always coming up and approaching us and saying, you know, I'm so glad you did this or you're doing a lovely job. Keep up the good work. We appreciate what you're doing. Um, 
you get your naysayers and and they're everywhere is nimbyism um, a big issue in newfoundland labrador it depends on the issue it can be <laughs> like you know it depends on what you're doing right That's true. um you know if if you're beautifying a neighborhood then you know everybody wants it in their neighborhood but if there's something that someone perceives could be you know conversa- uh, controversial well then you know it, it happens but again, that comes back to how you communicate to your your residents um, and and how you plan. And as long as they have the information up front and they know ahead of time, um, then you have an opportunity to work with them. They still might not want it, but at least it gives you an opportunity to talk with them, explain with them, you know, what the plan is, you know, what the outcome would be um, and hope that it goes through at that point. But yeah, you know, that's the same everywhere. I want to turn to our last segment now before, because I'm about five minutes away from the end here. Um, I want to talk about tourism. I love tourism. I love spending my tourism dollars in Canada instead of somewhere else. I love visiting municipalities and learning firsthand from counselors. So as I will be appearing in the town of uh, Grand Falls, Windsor later this year, I have pledged that if you come on the show, I will be there. So I'm doing a tour of Newfoundland and Labrador later this year. Um, What are some of the hidden gems in your community that the tour Tourists to your community should see. Well, I mean, Grand Falls, Windsor is just, we have so many things. Um, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> of course, our, you know, our walking trails, we have a uh, Gorge Park walking trail, Corduroy Brook walking trail, um, beautiful scenic trails. Um, the the uh, Gorge Park Trail is right on the majestic Exploits River, one of the best salmon rivers in the world. Um, you know, just great salmon fishing happening down there. We've got the Salmonid Interpretation Center with the underwater viewing window so you can see the salmon in their natural habitat coming up through the ladder and just, you know, a history of the river. Making the mental out. note of that. Oh, absolutely. And then, of course, you have the uh, river rafting on the Exploits River. Um, Oh, yes. And we have uh, just had um, uh, a resident install zip line on the Exploits River. So that's brand new, just just opened and started operating last summer. So that's been huge. We've got our Queen Street Dinner Theater that has been in operation for several years that has two and three offerings every summer of different productions, um, which is fabulous. We have, um, oh my gosh, just so much. All our recreational offerings, our Exploits Valley Salmon Festival happens in July, which is gonna be great again this year. Lots of concerts and fun activities for families and individuals of all ages. Um, Sounds like there's something for everyone. Absolutely. We, you know, we've got our ski, um, our ski trails and snowshoe trails, which are our lit trails. Um, so you can ski, uh, ski and uh, snowshoe at night. Uh, tons of opportunities in the trail network for snowmobiling and ATV riding and UTVs. Um, we just like we're we call Grand Falls Windsor perfectly centered, um, and we are we're perfectly centered on the island but we just have access to so much within our area. And uh, we just, I personally love it here. Um, And listen, there'll be no shortage of things to do when you come to visit. I am looking for it. Hopefully we can grab a coffee while I'm out there, but I want to absolutely. I want to end on the million dollar question. And this is the most important question. You can take as long as you want to answer this. What makes the town of Grand Falls, Windsor, such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, I guess the history of our town, obviously, um, you know, and how we came to be, you know, our forest defined us, you know, we, a paper mill, people came here and started a paper mill because of our forest industry. Um, And like I said, that paper mill was in, you know, in operation for hundreds of years and Grand Falls at the time, um, you know, was, the growing community um and then um you know with the expansion of the mill and all the jobs and all the spin-off that came from the mill um you know we had the towns of grand falls in windsor and we amalgamated in 91 and just became one community of grand falls windsor um 
We have health care here. We have tons of industry here, jobs, business opportunities, um, you know, the uh, recreational offerings that we have for our residents. Again, something for all ages, all the programs that we offer, everything from like baby yoga to, you know, adult yoga to you know, like seniors gymnastics. I mean, you know, everything. Um, just so much fun. And, and you know, we're, our community, I mean, you have a huge, um, you know, we have all different denominations here in the church community, religious community that people take part in, very active in their churches. Um, you know, our Santa Claus parade every year, all our volunteers come together and all our businesses come out to support and participate. Um, so many offerings for children from babies right to teenagers you know, the types of, you know, minor hockey, baseball, uh, soccer, gymnastics, karate, uh, softball, adult, you know, mixed uh, adult softball, men's, women's softball. You know, you've got the high schools who are participating in softball, um, all your school sports. We've got, you know, elementary, uh, primary elementary um, and high schools here, we've got uh, the College of the North Atlantic and uh, Keene College here for post-secondary. Um, just so many opportunities and just our residents are just fabulous. You know, our volunteer base, I mean, if you ask for anything, um, you know, any type of uh organization doing anything, like we just had our Special Olympics Winter Games and I mean, volunteers just like, what do you need? Tell me what you need. What can I do? How can I help? And all the athletes from across the province of Newfoundland and Labrador just coming together and just seeing how the community all comes together to support. Um, you know, it's it's just, it's a beautiful community and our weather is great, you know, so it's all pluses. I You've painted a very nice photo, oh, and I'm very much looking forward to visiting later on this year. But I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this today, Councillor. It's a pleasure to sit down with local councillors from across Canada and learn about them. So thank you so much. Uh, listen, I am so happy to see that, you know, the work that you're doing to uh, enhance uh, the enhance the work that municipal councillors do and really showcase that um you know watching some of your podcasts and your and your shows i'm just it's so touching and i'm so proud of every one of them um because i know the work that goes in and i know sometimes it might feel like a thankless job um but our you know we all know from the, in in our own hearts we know how much our residents appreciate the work that we do. And, um, you know, and any time that we have an opportunity to talk about it, I think we should absolutely be doing that. Um, so I certainly thank you for the opportunity, Chris, to be a part of your show. It's been a pleasure. So with that, I want to remind everyone, go put down social media for at least 15 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.